interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah so I just posted an article that said something to the effect that uh, uh, almost 50% of students 18 to 25 have picked up a spiritual practice mm. of some kind because of the wow. coronavirus. Yeah. Oh. And, you know, it runs the gamut, right? So it, some of it is some students are going online to worship services and some are reading scriptures, but some of it's meditation, yoga, Tara. <laughs> I mean, it's just well, whatever it is that would connect with the college students. So right. I guess we didn't do a formal introduction to recording this video. We're just talking about coronavirus and and the spiritual life of uh, young adults and how do you negotiate the virus in the midst of all this? And right. we have to be two United Kingdom pastors. <laughs> Huzzah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a United Kingdom. <laughs> what? No, go on, go on, sorry. Yeah, so I work at United Campus Ministry at Montana State University in Billings, uh, Montana, and um, an ecumenical ministry of seven denominations. So I get to wear many hats. And uh, you are? <laughs> I am the United Campus Ministries minister in La Crosse, Wisconsin, at UWL, Viterbo, and Western Tech. Technical College. I represent five denominations, yeah. um, and like you, we're we are in this wild west time of faith and spirituality when our campuses are closed, but our students yeah. continue to live lives and have school. Yeah, and it's you know, and I'm I'm sorry to hear you know from students. I mean, in some measure, some professors have kind of said, "Look, we're in the middle of a crisis." I just want you to be able to get through the material and pass it and call it a day. Right. And I have other student professors who are like, you know, when it's online, we have to double the work. And so I have some students who are pretty stressed right now. Right, I bet. <laughs> As a result of that decision, yeah, because they're negotiating other things beyond their classes. So. Right. Well, and like, I mean, I just um, noticed that. I've noticed for a lot of my students that there's like this pandemic crisis that's kind of sitting on top of other stuff that's going on, right? Like a lot of people have graduation coming up and then all of a sudden are their jobs, right? Are their careers? How is the things are going to be doing funded? And that's causing anxiety. Um, I've had students, I've had two students with uh, deaths in the family, like the week that we all went on lockdown. Um, so all, oh. of a, but all of a sudden you can't gather with your family to grieve. All of a sudden you can't, have a big funeral right like it's kind of a lot of people feel like my, no, a lot of my students, yeah a lot of students seem to be like in a, they feel like they're in a holding pattern of just like waiting for permission to grieve or to hope right like about whatever comes next yeah and that's just been the most heartbreaking i've had a lot of i mean basically i've not had students who've experienced that yet at msub but I've had friends around the country who have had experiences, and some directly related to coronavirus, you know, where, oh, wow. and, 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 and grieving deaths because of that, yeah. Uh, Montana is kind of uh, on the tail end, so we haven't had the numbers, but we've definitely had the shutdowns on the... <laughs> right. <laughs> and the, yeah. Um, but, yeah. And I have a number of students graduating this year, so thinking about work, with 20% unemployment and <laughs> right. and um, the ability even to who's hiring. Um, yeah, make, make major life decisions, yeah. but everything's frozen. And um, and then the other, you know, some like, like you said, uh, for us, a lot of it is just social. I mentioned earlier that I think we're going to keep on meeting on Zoom regardless of when the semester closes because a lot of students are just at home, not doing a whole lot. Right. <laughs> so any, any kind of social connection matters and ends up being important. So. so, and how do you think this is going to affect the shape of doing this kind of work for the future? Like what's, 
ministry going to look like on the other side? Of this? Are we going to have a lot of people who all of a sudden need what we're offering, or are people going to be continue to be distant from each other? Like, like I just keep thinking about like my grandparents' generation coming through the war and like still maintaining a certain level of distance and thriftiness and rationing, even though the war was over. And like, I'm wondering how this generation will respond. You know? Oh, that's yeah. Well, there, there's a short term and a long term, right? In the short term, I mean, it is a, a genuine question. We don't know if we'll have in-person classes in the fall, right? Which, which makes it tricky to you know reach out to students. I mean, in my sense is I would have my base of students from us this right. year, but it would be really tricky to pull in other people on an online format. Right. Um, yeah, once people start. Once we can get to the point where that we're meeting in person, I, you know, I can imagine t two opposite responses. Uh, the, because I can, I, you know, I hear people say, you know, I never realized how much I miss people and connection and being together until I was denied it. And right. so people have been saying, you know, well, once this, once this gets, we we're able to move on from it. We're you know, we're going to even be more intentional about nurturing relationships and communities and in-person contacts. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, at least, I, and I can see that with college students, to be honest, at least from what I'm hearing, that they really value that connection and, and they're not experiencing it. Um, I do worry about our churches because there's always mm -hmm. a percentage of folks who are kind of loosely connected and would show up sometimes. Right. And once gotten used to that, they don't really need to do that. And they can organize life without it. Um, it it's, I can imagine both. Like I can imagine some institutions can't handle that weight because in fact, you know, you know uh, uh, the peripheral folks have moved on. Um, but yeah, I don't know what's your sense of that. I mean, my situation is, is a bit different in that, again, we don't know what's gonna happen in the fall, right? Like, so as you said, recruiting new students is gonna be really hard. Um, I've got a core group of five who are all about to graduate. So one way or the other, oh, yeah. I'm coming back in the fall with like rebuilding, you know, again, as it is. Um, so yeah. my sense is if there, if there is no on location uh, class, having, even a virtual program is going to be a little bit difficult. I don't know what that's going to look like off the top of things. Um, the sense I'm getting from students is that people are feeling disconnected and feeling lonely and feeling um, the need for some kind of hope, some kind of hope in community, right? Um, mm. I, was, I was talking to a student the other day who like said she just wants to get together with people and do something for the world. Um, yeah. And I, I can see us, I can see campus ministry and the churches being one of the few places where we can make that happen and that's important um but you know I we keep so. talking about we keep talking about like essential services like you know oh we, we've all discovered that uh grocery workers are essential services right i don't think people are discovering that clergy or churches mm -hmm. are essential services like we need a different word for what we are like these locations of meaning making in the in the face of chaos and hope um, we need a different word for what yeah for what we are you know yeah, and I think, you know, um, I can imagine, yes. Um, I think that in some ways it's the, well, certainly churches have been very vital in trying to create community in the midst of the pandemic and nurturing that. But I can imagine even more so after the pandemic, uh, like you said, because of questions of meaning and um, like I said, I, I was astonished to see almost half of 18 to 25 year olds picking up spiritual practices to right. just give them some sanity in the, in the midst of it all. I mean, I, I do worry because of the culture wars. Uh, we had a church that uh, defied state orders and held a rally slash work. Oh, wow. Worship service. And so the way the Christianity or churches are seen in the wider culture, you know, to the degree that that focuses on that, 
is just, it's a familiar impediment that we just run into, right? That certain forms of churches and communities have um, are seen as spreading the virus, or at least being indifferent to it. Right. And so that's a thing to kind of overcome, <laughs> even though uh, like almost ninety percent of churches have stopped meeting in person, and um, that cuts across traditions. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, which is really remarkable to, to calibrate the entire country within like a week right. to do that. I, if you would have asked, it took 40 years to get us to wear seat belts. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a 40 year campaign, please wear seat belts. You know? right. And I remember watching a video from the, it was from the eighties. It was like this Canadian film and they're like trying to respond to people like, well, it'll, re it'll uh, put wrinkles in my dress if I wear a seat belt, wear a seat belt anyways. <laughs> so this is remarkable, <laughs> you know, testimony. Yeah. Uh, I, in one way, we, we really got it right. It's just, yeah, there's always yeah. some there's some bad actors. Yeah. I'm, I'm loving how we're learning how fragile injustice is in all of this, right? Like, in the United Kingdom, they told all the city councils, you know, fix homelessness by the end of this week, and they did. Yeah. And they did. Like, like, <laughs> Like exactly. for, ye for years, people were saying, oh, no, we can't deal with the homelessness situation. It's too big. It's too hard. And in a week, they fixed it, right? Like we're learning yeah. that a lot of the, the things that we thought were in the systemic injustices are fragile. Like it takes a lot of energy and a lot of protest to hold the system together. And then we could just do a new, like insulin, like, oh, insulin makers will we'll only char charge 35 bucks now instead of hundreds of, do hundreds of dollars, right? Like. We, yeah, the the injustice of it was fragile. No, that, like we could we could undo it quickly. Yeah, no, exactly. I think there's. I mean, that's. I'm mean, hoping that's a lesson that stays with us. You know, because uh, you know we were literally we can't afford health care for everybody because it costs too much, and now we're right. just turning out trillions, right, to make things happen. So yeah, so clearly we had the capacity. And um, yeah, and and along with it, the whole the world and its institutions, political and otherwise, are not this thing that's set in stone. It's something that can be quickly, quickly, uh, yeah. Um, like I, yeah, I hope we don't lose that. Yeah, you know, in, in my um, big my big fear is that we're learning all these lessons about the world and about what's important and who's essential. And it's going to be like 9-11. Like after 9-11, we, we said never again. And we had this sense of brotherhood. And then it all kind of went away, right? Like we kind of forgot. And I'm, I'm really scared that after all of this, we're going to learn all these lessons. At least maybe our generation, maybe not you and I, but our generation, will kind of forget and, you know. Well, you know, that is an interesting thing when you mentioned about 9-11. Because so, so this is a scary, weird thing to say. But. So I remember reading a study, events that occur between 14 and 20 tend to define your life. Right. Events that happen after that, not so much, mm -hmm. which is really bizarre to think in those terms because this pandemic is like, to me, like something that just uh, has shaken everything. Oh, and I'm thinking of the word, it, uh, it's from, um, Nadia Boltz Weber, she, she refers to the apocalypse as an unveiling, okay. making, uh, making known what was unknown, you know, which mm -hmm. is what's been happening to our structures. And yet, unless you are of a certain age where this was a defining moment for your existence, it may or may not impact you. Right. Because you've already got the headspace of whatever was definitive for your time. And in, for me, that was the 80s. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> like, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, I just, uh, you know, I mean, and, and I guess maybe I'm encouraged for the, you know, like millennials to experience 9-11 um, and, and the Iraq war and the crash. Uh, and now they're talking about Generation Z. Right. Uh, is really the 18 to, yeah, they're the ones who are experiencing and coming into college with this pandemic as, as a defining moment. And from what I've seen in these studies, that, that won't change. 
and it will inform that generation. Right. Um, it's just that some of us might be too old to to notice. <laughs> well, you know, my so I keep jokingly calling this the apocalypse, and my wife had to ask me to, to stop doing that. But like the reason I jokingly call it the apocalypse is because at one point I made a list <laughs> of all the apocalypses I lived through, right? Like Y two K and. 9-11, like all these things that the evangelical world I grew up in said it was going to be the end of the world. Like I made a list of everything and it was, it was a huge list. So for me, like to, calling it the apocalypse dismisses it because mm -hmm. it's just another thing, right? Like it's just another trauma. We'll get through it. We'll be fine. Like it's, as you said, it's not the life defining thing because I've seen eight or nine previous world changing traumas. Like this is nothing, right? We'll have this, we'll have a few more. Hey. Yeah. Young people, they don't understand, right? Like, it's easy to get in that headspace at a certain age. Yeah. I think it, well, and I think, uh, like you said, uh, I like that phrase. I never heard, really thought of it. The apocalypse is an unveiling. Um, and so some of those apocalypses were, may or may not be, right? right. Like, uh, apparently, nine, like I said, the Y2K proved not to be. Right, yeah. But yeah. Um, I think 9-11 was and i think the pandemic is and i even thought of my my, my when i was 14 the, the challenger blew up right, right and yep. even in a yeah, yeah <laughs> even, that was even in a small way that was an apocalypse of a kind because i kind of grew up with america always is on the technological edge we're just hmm. always doing more and more and more stupidity you know it kind right. of like the Titanic, right? You know, when, like realizing, oh, we don't actually know everything and not everything right. works. 9-11 is like, oh, terrorism and everything, that happens over there in those other countries. Right. We're, we're protected by an ocean. And, um, and same thing with the virus in a way, you know, we've had pandemics, it's just it's never hit the US. Right. We're, we're somehow protected, you know, somehow. I mean, so you're I mean, talking about the you're talking about the whole idea of the unveiling and you're a philosophy guy, right? So uh, Lacan's real, the, was it reality versus the real, right? Where the, we go, oh, it's just reality that we have spaceships. The real is the challenger blows up and our dependence on technology is more fragile than we realized. And we're, right, like, can, can you unpack that a little bit for us? Because I mean, you're, you're a philosophy guy, you teach. I, I have, unfortunately, I haven't read Lacan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm just trying to think of it as, yeah. well, the, the, so I'll use a phrase I do, I do know, um, and I was just writing about, it was from a plausibility structures, um, and it comes from Peter Berger. Okay. Who's kind of sociologist of religion, but uh, it's kind of just how the world works, what we accept is true. Um, and you can get pretty well wrapped up into them. And they're very useful because we don't have the ability to independently. So I, I can't hear you. Your voice is frozen. Your picture's frozen and your voice is breaking up. Uh, I'd like to think uh, I'm having internet issues. Yeah, you're moving a little bit now, but it's very slow. <laughs> you're oh, in slow motion. Uh, okay, now I can hear you a little. Okay, good. So let's see, I'll see. So I was talking about plausibility structures. Okay. And plausibility structures comes from an idea from Peter Berger that, you know, we have these institutions and norms and kind of just expectations, this is how the world works. This is uh, what counts as true, what counts as not true, what's this kind of a like given, um, given the kind of world we live in. But a lot of that is rather artificially propped up. And, hmm. and we're reliant on those structures because we don't have the time in it, you know, to, to check every single thing that comes our way. So having a worked out idea in your head of how the world works helps. But then you do get something like a virus that can just upend it. It's a, it's a dose of realism, <laughs> right? Because right. the structures are always so structured. 
we can't solve homelessness as a part of the plausibility structure. Because all of our life we've had homeless. You know, I've seen homeless since I was a kid. It's like that was the structure that that's how the world works. And in some ways, um, you know, growing up in the eighties, capitalism and the way it worked for supposed to work. Uh Let's give it a thing and literally in an important time you you start to see it as an inadequate structure in the first place. Um, it no longer really describes how the thing works. Right. So that might be a, a close to Lacan, I'm not sure. and I don't know much Lacan. I just like I you know, I read Zizek quoting Lacan, like that's all I so I'm uh, I was guessing as well, but you know I so yeah. going back to, like the whole going back to the question of like our faith and spirituality at this time, like I feel a little bit like I'm stuck in a perpetual Holy Saturday, right? Like I got chaos on one side, <laughs> and there's some kind of resurrection coming, but we don't know what it's going to look like or when it's going to be. Like in Wisconsin, we have another month of the stay yeah. stay at home order. Like we just don't know when that's going to end. Uh, my wife is an educator; she's an aide doesn't really know if they're gonna be budget cuts for the fall and what work will look like uh, for that. So we're kind of in this perpetual Holy Saturday and it's very easy, I think, to kind of come up with spiritual slogans of well, after the plague comes the rainbow, which is the one I've, I've been hearing a lot, which might be true, That's not, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but like, I think the point of Holy Saturday <laughs> is to kind of sit in the unknown and kind of be okay with it. Or not maybe not okay, but like to accept that, that this is the fact, like, the disciples in the upper room had to just be in a room grieving and accept the reality that death happened, right? That chaos happened. And I, it's, yeah, as far as like a spiritual practice, like having to sit in this time of Holy Saturday and going, well, shit, this is what it is. And be yes. okay with not knowing what's well, next. Yeah, there's a, a Reinhold Niebuhr quote. It goes something, I'm going to badly botch it, but it's something to the effect of, the Christian faith knows no way around suffering. It right. only knows a way through the suffering. Right. Um, and I do suspect that could, this kind of uh, longer term pandemic could puncture some people's plausibility structures, <laughs> right? Because Christian faith is really seen as a some sort of like, for some, a protective talisman. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, the, and the virus doesn't obey those kind of things. Right. And so, um, yeah, thinking about what resources and faith can help us go through it. The interesting thing, and I just, was that what I run into, because we do have this wonderful tradition of Holy Saturday to, to be with. Um, and yeah, it's when I look online of who are the religious voices that speak to me, and give me some comfort in the middle of everything, it's always been Jewish rabbis. <laughs> like, the, even in my clergy are just, they're not always helpful in thinking through right. suffering, but Judaism seems like that is what it does well. And so I'm just seeing these rabbis becoming spiritual um, sources of support for so many people around the country. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, it's almost a form of spiritual abuse that I've seen where you go to a funeral. Yeah, Judaism knows how to relate to the question of suffering, and as a result, it's down real. Right. And like, it almost seems like, like I was saying, it almost feels, feels like a form of spiritual abuse where you, you kind of go to a funeral or, or whatever, and you go, I'm sad because grandma's dead. And someone goes, oh, but our hope's in heaven. It's all going to be okay, right? Like, it becomes this escape button yeah. from reality. Or the real, like it, it comes in a skate button from the actual concrete world that we live in. And if I have, yeah. if I take, if I take liberation theology seriously, God meets us in the suffering, right? God meets us in the trauma and the chaos. And, I, and I've been thinking a lot about Jesus walking on the water, right, between the the capitalists and whatever, um, and water being chaos in Jewish thought. And that, like you have, like that's kind of where it's at sometimes, like trusting mm -hmm. that Jesus is walking in the chaos with us, we're in the boat, we're gonna get out of the boat, we might sink a bit, 
and that's okay. Like being okay with the fact that it is chaotic and hurt, it hurts and we don't know what's going on. If that makes sense. Yeah, as human beings want to see You're frozen again, sorry. We want to flee God. But maybe another way of saying, you know, to be in the water. We don't want to be what? Sorry, you the, the picture is frozen. I can't hear your voice. Or just bits of it. You there? Oh no. Are you there, Dwight? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, there. Now I can hear you. There you are. Now you're moving. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Now I was just saying that, you know, when Bart talks about people wanting to flee God, uh, all of a sudden it makes sense. It's not so much fleeing God, it's fleeing. Um, Holy Saturdays, it's fleeing, not wanting to be in the waters, not wanting to man if God counters us, it, it, then that's the way in which we try to flee it. <laughs> right. So let me ask you, you know, a question. Um, what, um, yeah. Oh, no, go on. Sorry. Oh, no, no, continue. So, what was your oh. question? Oh, so, so we're talking about these Holy Saturdays and walking across the chaos and whatever. Um, what is the spirit? What spiritual practices do you have you found are helpful helpful for you? Because I find going outside and screaming at God has been very helpful for me sometimes. And I've been trying to tell my students <laughs> that it's okay to tell God to f off if we need to. Yeah. Boy, I wish I had. I mean, definitely being outside helps. And we've been taken to hiking. <laughs> nice. Um, I've been riding a lot because that seems to be where some of these ideas, more so than I have done before. Uh, um, and it's mainly because I'm sitting with these ideas in my head and I just have to put them down. I like the idea of being able to yell at God. Um, I mean, I, you know, I tend to go with process thought and, and think of God as obviously those are the helpers and those are the folks who are going to pull us through right. <laughs> that, through this pandemic, not kind of the master who determines all events kind of thing. But, right. but um, I, you know, I could say that if there's a crisis of faith, it's kind of the realization um, the realization that um, the, our, the Christian tradition is a very fragile one itself and being able to respond to these things, depending on the community and, and the context, could respond well or not very well at all. <laughs> um, so, so there's kind of a grief for the fragility of some of the institutions and some of the um, ways we've organized life. So maybe, um, but I, 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 yeah, writing and nature, to be honest, the Zoom calls help me. For some people I know it can be a burden. You get screen fatigue, but uh, right. I really do enjoy hearing other people's voices <laughs> and not being, uh, being uh, uh, feeling isolated, I suppose. Right. So what has been helpful for you? Uh, like I said, like one a thing that's been really helpful for me is like going outside. Again, I'm, I mean, I'm a post-theist as far as my theology goes, uh, but sometimes I need a God with skin mm -hmm. on, and I like to go for walks and tell God to F off because mm -hmm. the world's messed up right now, and it's time to get things together. Um, so that's been very helpful. Um, and the other part, 
for me, as far as my spirituality goes, is uh, being a dad has been helpful. Because I got these three people for who, who are living through this chaos right now, and I have to help them make sense of it. And like, I have to like not hide from, the, hide from them that things are scary, but I also have to not scare them more. Um, so talking through yeah. that with them has been a really important practice. And then just, you know, at dinner, doing our, our, our mealtime prayer and making sure that we name something that we're grateful for has been helpful. Because I think it's easy to get stuck, mm -hmm. especially in my own, you know, my brain with the squirrels going nonstop. Um, it's, it's, it's easy to get stuck in the worry and the anxiety. And I think just sitting down and being thankful has been very helpful. If that makes sense. Yes. That makes utter sense. I love seeing your kids on Facebook, by the way. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, I mean, it, it, I mean, like, I, I'm sure it can be frustrating, but it's, it, it, it strikes me also as an adventure, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. I, and, you know, I will say, <clears throat> one thing has come to force, but everybody has their own responses. Right. Then when I, when I hear the, um, <laughs> there was a discussion online on whether we should be able to do in-person communion or not right. in-person, whether you could do, uh, uh, yeah, distant communion. And admittedly, I came to the point of, I was frustrated because I'm like, why do you care? Like, right. I know our communion is important, but why are we debating this? Right. But actually, I kind of think that is kind of like, uh, you know, there's two different reactions. And one reaction is to hold on what you can hold on to in the midst of the pandemic. But I'm finding for myself the opposite reaction, where you're going, well, what's really important in the end? And that a pandemic can make us <coughs> focus on what really matters and such that <coughs> other things that seemed important pre-pandemic right. may not really hold much water afterwards. <laughs> right. And that can be kind of liberating. Right. You no. Know? <laughs> and yeah. I hope that's another thing that's not forgotten. So like so I mean you talk about the whole communion thing, which I I, I mean I've seen these conversations as well and they're they're fascinating because one I'm a, I'm a lay person in ministry. So my, my approach has to be different to begin with. Like I, in campus ministry, I focus on the agape meal as, as my mm -hmm. thing. So I, I've been kind of building this theology of like what happens on Sunday extends outward through every meal, coffee, interaction that we have during the week. Like there's a, there's a, a holy moment of real presence when we share a coffee with somebody who is suffering or hurting or when we share a meal with somebody who is celebrating, right? Like, that this, the, the agape meal, the love feast, the, the communion meal is not a one-time event. It, it's ongoing and it continues. Yeah. And this has kind of been the theology I've been trying to build on. And it's still, a, it's very much a rough draft at this point in my own head. Um, but it's helping me frame it in a way and frame it to my students in a way where we can still have sacred moments with each other. Yeah. And I think what I've discovered, my own experience of it has been, if it, people are intentional where that we're having the sacred moment. And I right. steal this from Martin Luther. Um, you know, Luther talks about like in uh, preaching, it's not the words that are said, it's the way it touches you. Right. And uh, I kind of think that with communion and where it's like, like, look, if we're all engaged in the sacred act, it will be received as such. Right. And so for some of my friends who can never accept online communion, I, I, I all I have to say is, you're right, you can't, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, um, where, that's where you're at, and that's how right. things are. It can't be that. For me, I discovered that, because I've been through some online communions, and I discovered that if they say the words of institution, my brain just goes, aha, sacred yes. moment. Like if they don't say it, it's not always, my brain doesn't always register it. Right. But there might be other ways of doing that. Like when I think of the agape meal too, where you're like, where we're, we're very, we're intentional in the, what we're about to, to share. And right. we're invoking something of God's presence in the midst of this. 
yeah um it, it seems to like it works right. <laughs> there's a theology it's a pragmatism it works <laughs> right right right, right. <laughs> you know yeah. the divine is invoked and it happens you know? <laughs> and i mean i admit that like my so when i was in seminary i was volunteering at a place called lums it was a lutheran urban mission society and they had this movie night for these fellows who lived on the street like it was the poorest postal code in canada um, and I was, I volunteered and we were in the back in the kitchen making sandwiches, the round, this round table. And I had this overwhelming sensation that this was communion, right? The idea of communion being in that kind of context, that kind of setting done by lay people to meet people's real needs has shaped my experience of communion ever since. And it's why I'm doing the work that I do, right? That there's something about God and the presence of love and the real concrete world that we live in. And it's, it comes through in our relationships, you know? Yeah, and I, my, my thread to that was, um, and I'm not trying to appropriate or steal another religion, I say that as a proviso, but I had a friend who was uh, rediscovering his Judaism, and every Friday night, you know, in his dorm room, he'd get some wine and bread, and, and he would go through Sabbath prayers, and he would invite me to be a part of it. Oh, wow. And, uh, and like, so we were both undergrads. And every time I felt like I was having <laughs> I didn't know how to say, I'm not trying to take over the Sabbath. Is right, I know yeah, I'm yeah. Prayers. But what I mean is for me, it just, like, same thing. Yeah. So it's more of a sense, God is here. Right. This is a sacramental moment. <laughs> yeah. the, the poetry of it almost, right? I, uh, and I, I love yeah. that story. And I love that story that you just shared because um, my, oh, go on. I, I love that story you just shared because my, my wife is a Christian today because of the Muslim families that looked after her while she was growing up, right? Like the way that our faith oh. communities intersect and our, these traditions kind of intersect and inspire, we, we inspire each other and, you know, all the people who love God should just love each other as well and not worry about all the various doctrinal fights. Yeah, well, and my, my, so I've been reading, I've been having my students read Josiah Royce for my introduction to ethics. Okay. And a class, uh, and it's a bit interesting because what Royce talks about, he calls uh, loyalty to loyalty. The basic idea is um, uh, what you just described, right? But it's something to the fact that when you get inspired by, you may not agree with another person, but their faith is moves you <laughs> right yeah and you recognize something fundamentally human about what we're all trying to do despite the differences right um as a side note to make a point for royce he, he's not very famous today but he came up with the phrase the beloved community oh okay and he was, yes and he was read by martin luther king in seminary <laughs> ah nice nice nice, nice. <laughs> yeah <laughs> So, yeah, and <laughs> that's why, you know, when I think about the prior issue, people are responding in various ways, and I'm trying to, as a discipline, see this as uh, diverse ways people are able to respond to crisis. Right. I do get frustrated with, we had, a, like I said, a protest, and I'm like, why are you doing this? You're endangering other people what is going on there and and the partisan ends that are involved but but also the f genuine fears people have and somehow try to use that at least as data or something you know to kind right. of realize we're all trying to process and figure right yeah we i mean i i've got a i've got a seven-year-old at home who's very smart and very intelligent Mm -hmm. And he's watching and he's watching the news trying to figure out all, all this out. And he, he's watching about the coronavirus and like he's asking questions like why are people protesting? They're going to get sick and they're going to die. And that's ca causing anxiety for him. And we're trying to talk about ways that we can like acknowledge that those those pre protesters have real concerns, right? Like people are concerned about their incomes and their food and their rent. And like the, those are all valid things to be worried about, like to have compassion for those protesters because they're not evil people and they're not trying to like overthrow the government they're not trying to whatever narratives we can throw on top of it like they're just people who are scared 
mm. and, and how do we extend compassion to them and also keep the world healthy at the same time and you know again yeah. i don't have the answers but i have a seven-year-old who wants to ask about it every day yeah oh sure sure and admittedly i get frustrated because i do think there are political actors who want to exploit people's fears right. uh so that's frustrating but to see the folks who are doing this as individuals uh and uh that is great, by the way. That's going to be a lifetime habit for, for your son. <laughs> <laughs> it really will be, you know, because, I mean, these are the, you know, this, you'll probably talk to other kids, like, did you watch the news, too, when you were a kid? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, this is the kid who binge watches TED Talks. Uh, you know, there's, there's just no stopping them. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> No, seriously, that is very encouraging. But because, um, you know, and those are the memories that you'll, you'll remember too, just thinking about the news. And uh, uh, like I said, in some ways, it, we can get overwhelmed with all the news, but it's kind of, it gives a bit of power, uh, I think, you know, to right. make sense of everything. Uh, so you're not just a passive observer. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So I think there's all the, and you know, I'm kind of intrigued because I know we, we've been uh, recording for an hour, but I wanted to ask okay. you guys, you, as you think about post-theism, as we're thinking about, um, you think religious sensibilities will change. The need for spirituality community, it seems like we're saying, we'll definitely want to find outlets, especially in the post you know, post-pandemic um do you think the structures of the church or the doctrines will be impacted by people's experience in the pandemic i mean i think a new context always changes things right every time you have a new context or a new situation things change um and again i tend to approach religion as a um set of poetry right like, and poetic experiences mm -hmm. um so and i, I think the gifts of our tradition of a holy meal, um, passing the peace, um, laying on of hands, the washing of feet, like all of these things, I think will have new currency or can have new currency as forms of poetry uh, where we re-explore what it means to connect and to be socially present with each other. Um, so I think we have an opportunity as communities of faith to reframe a communion or agape meals as moments of deep connection with each other and deep community connection. Um, after social distancing, I think we should reclaim the, the church tradition of laying on of hands, right? Like I know the Pentecostals mm. kind of have a corner on that, but I think we have an opportunity to really embrace it as a way of greeting each other and loving each other and praying for each other uh, in a post-social distance world because we, we're going to need connection again. Um, and that'll be emotional connection, spiritual connection, as well as physical connection. Um, so I think what yeah. the... But as far as like the question of what is God and where is God and all of this, um, I mean, we can't help but rethink that and ask some deep questions of that. Um, and you know, my bias is everybody will become raging post theists and whatever, but who knows? That's, um, or maybe we'll all turn to Sally McFaig and like the created world itself is the body of God emerging or maybe throw in some John Caputo, right? Like who knows? Um, but I think we'll be asking some really good questions after all of this. And, and if we're not asking good questions, then we're not doing a good job as a church and ministries, right? Because this is a very important time to start yeah. asking things and rethinking things. Um, yeah, that's just my, my, that's my ramble. It's a good old fashioned ramble. No, that's great. I think, I think that's right. Like if you get the good questions out of this, we could do something interesting. Right. It's, 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 it's interesting to me that every, uh, it sounds, this isn't to glamorize this, I genuinely think some of the best theologians in the modern era, it's interesting, were uh, particularly formed by World War I and World War II, mm -hmm. because crisis requires creative thought. Right. And uh, so there is kind of a little bit like, I wonder what theology will be coming out, you know, because in the middle of everything here, and, and will it be as responsible? Responsive to kind of those needs. I'm also reminded of my pastor uh, in Billings. He does a, when he does children's moments. He prior to the pandemic, he'd have us. They'd have the 
kids, when they would come up to the children's moment, before they leave, before they, as they were praying, they all kind of had to touch elbows or arms or, you know, they weren't like folded hands, but they were like touched, you know. Um, and basically, it's, yeah, he would say, you know, if we're, if we're gonna make it through the world, we're gonna have to hold on to each other, <laughs> right? Be strong. And, 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 and he develops this kind of, every children's moment has that, like how are we gonna hang together? and be strong for each other. That's kind of the takeaway of every children's moment. And I'm hoping those kids have an experience of that. Right. Or of those, of, of that, yeah. Right. So, and I mean, I guess my final question or my final thought is, so in the fall, if, if, if classes are back on your campus, my campus, however it works, how do we help a generation of students mm -hmm. process their trauma? Right? Like yeah. what kind of, what do we do? I don't even know what the answer is yet. Cause it's just, I don't know. It, just, it seems big. Well, my, I don't have a one either. I'm just gonna say that's gonna be an ongoing question, but I would say right. that uh, Montana has a tradition. Maybe Wisconsin does, we're gonna man up or woman up, <laughs> right? Right, right. And we're just gonna we're just gonna face the challenge straight ahead. And so, what could be useful for campus ministries is to name trauma, hmm. and and to identify it and, and and create a space for accepting that reality. So, we'll come maybe in the fall with brave faces, like let's do this. We're gonna conquer the school year. Yeah, you know, and go. Yeah, but to name the grief that is real and the trauma that is real might create space for students to, yeah, maybe, you know, there really was something lost last year, you know? Right. Um, that we, that, or that it's important to negotiate, yeah. Right. Yeah, I feel like there needs to be some um, kind of ritual or ceremony to help people name the grief and the trauma, but I don't know what that looks like yet. I'm still trying to, Figure that out. Oh yeah, I would love to. Yeah, we should talk. <laughs> <laughs> we, and, um, we should do it because uh, I think that would be really something that you can rope in the college collectively on. Like you can talk, you know. In other words, like for us, it's a center for engagement. You know, but there's usually an office that is thinking about students personal and interpersonal wise or the, or the counseling center. Right. Um, and say, is there a way we can collectively do something as a campus? The, um, like right now, our campus has been trying to build community through online events. And they've been very, very successful. But that's kind of managing the crisis. But what I think moving to that next stage will be a big question for colleges. And campus ministry can be the place to, to say college. Have you considered <laughs> right. where your students are going to be in the fall? Yeah. Well, I appreciate this so much. Yeah, man. I'm Thank you so much. It's kind of helpful. I'd love to do it again. <laughs> okay. And uh, and if you want, if anybody's watching this video and say, hey, I want to join in the conversation, we can make a Zoom meeting for several people. Yeah, definitely. Um, we can do it that way too, but but I will go ahead and end the recording and say thank you guys for watching. Yeah, thank you. So